Okay, uh, I think uh, we might get started. Uh, today, I want to thank uh, Dr. David Hart for coming here to have a presentation from Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin, as he's uh, assistant director of the presentation. Oh. There. Actually, I'm not. Oh, somebody wrote it down. <laughs> I, I saw that you're, you're, you're associated with Extension. But I'm, a, I'm in a division of Extension, yeah. Okay. Well, I read this. Ahead I would time. not mind that promotion. What I, know, <laughs> what I need to do is read the short bio on the back. Yeah, I think that. So uh, he has a PhD and, and is a hydrogeologist and a geophysicist with the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. And a professor at the university. Yes, yes, that's a more correct. Really, the appointment in geoscience and geologic engineering studies. Dave's applied research is focused on collecting more and better data to inform geologic and hydrogeologic uh, models. These data include measurements of borehole flows and heads in crystalline rock, determining depth of bedrock using geophysics and applications of victory. Temperature measurements applied to ground surface, groundwater surface interaction, and using fiber optic distributed temperature sensing and heat pump geothermal application. Thank you. That covers it. Thank you, Thank you John. Um, so, so today I'm going to talk about Arduino based instrumentation for groundwater and surface water measurements, and maybe hopefully get some of you excited about it and, and maybe see the possibilities that these things present. Um, here I am at the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. I'm going to acknowledge a lot of people here, and that's uh, to do two things. One is we should acknowledge our, our colleagues and coworkers when, when they're working with us. And the other reason is to kind of point out that this has been an ongoing and multiple group um, effort. And what that told me, what that tells me is that I've found some value in it. And because I've kept doing it over the years and, and kind of have expanded it. So I'd first like to acknowledge uh, uh, Sue Swanson and Jake Westridge from Beloit College, Chin Wu, Ben Saren, Dante Frada, and Susie Richmond from Civil Engineering at Madison. And then in the geoscience, Catherine Christensen, Jean Barr, and Mike Cardiff, Andy Leaf at the USGS, and then Kirk Olson from the uh, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Um, so uh, what, what, what's kind of driving all of this effort, what's driving all of this work is um, decisions concerning our natural resources. We need, we're doing more modeling. It's more complex. It's more interwoven, intertwined. And we need, um, we need data to support those models. And here's an example of uh, Aloha um, ecological limits of hydrologic alteration. We may be worried about this little um, red-bellied dace here. That's the fish of concern. And uh, we may do a groundwater flow model that tells us something about the stream temperature. And then the temperature and stream flow are gonna feed into a model that will tell us whether or not this dace is gonna exist in 2050 as things warm up or as precipitation changes. And so we're, we need data to be able to constrain our models. Things are all interwoven. Um, this is maybe a geophysicist. Uh, you may, uh, John mentioned that I do some geophysics. This is maybe a geophysicist point of view where data is equal to a model operating on some parameters. And so um, about 10 years ago, maybe even 15 years ago, I looked around and I saw a ton of people doing modeling. Uh, we had um, Mary Anderson at UW-Madison and Randy Hunt, who's at the USGS office in Mad Madison, Middleton. Uh, they, they're doing applied groundwater modeling. Um, we saw Professor Dante Frada from the Civil Engineering, discrete signals and inverse problems. And then um, uh, Cliff Thurber, also a UW-Madison seismologist, parameter estimations and inverse problems. So there were a ton of people doing work on the modeling and parameterization side, but there weren't many people doing collecting data to support these models. So that's kind of what I thought, hey, that's my niche. Let's see if I can, can um, keep up with these guys and their, 
you know, computers have been getting faster and faster and faster. You can do more and more models, but the data needs to keep up with the computers and the, and the ability to model. And so I'm, now I'm gonna give some examples of using temperature here. And so we're gonna look at groundwater discharge areas and streams, and then we'll look at some seepage measurements, you know, basic data that any groundwater model needs. And um, we're, we're also gonna make use of, uh, in our data, we're gonna make use of several trends that are within the last 10 years or so. Locating data is now easy. Uh, so for example, if I were to pull out my phone, I know where I am. I wasn't late today because I could follow a blue dot to this hall. You know, it's, we know where we are. 20 years ago, when I was trying to do geophysics and know where I was on a field, I would mark a, a quad map, one of those topographic maps. That's kind of the best I could do. Now, I just, I can use my phone or I can use something even much better. So now we can now locate ourselves. Uh, storing large amounts of data is low cost. You know, this, this uh, the uh, 64 gigabyte chip there is, is blown as much larger than scale shown on the screen. It's tiny. These things are so tiny. 64 gigabytes, how many lines of text can you put on that? It, it's almost it, impossible to fill with, with the measurements that I'm doing. And then we can also develop prototype instruments. Uh, we have these low cost microcontrollers. I've been using the Arduino. There's also the Raspberry Pis that are out there. A huge number of sensors. And then what, what also has helped there are these internet project hubs where you can go look things up and, and get an idea of how to, um, how to make connections. Um, the, and, and part of that internet hub is this maker cult culture, which unfortunately I think has been set back by, the, by, by COVID and the pandemic. But it was people would get together, the do it yourself, the hacker and artisan cultures were all, were all kind of inter, interacting and intertwined. And they would, um, I Googled this several years ago, but uh, makerspace near me, this is Madison. And I came up with three of these. I'm sure you could do the same here in the Twin Cities and you'd have double or triple or quadruple this number of makerspaces. And these are, what are these makerspaces? They're kind of for these artisan do it yourself hacker type people who provides tools, workspace, and guidance. So you can, um, uh, this one, the Bodgery, the was one of the ones in Madison. You have a woodworking shop, welding, blacksmithing, 3D printing, sewing studio, um, CNC milling and routing. And then again, this is several years ago, um, this uh, young man named Charlie built an electric long, long board. It was gonna cost him one to 2000 to buy one, but he, um, found online how to put it together. And uh, this is what I find a little bit terrifying. He can go seven miles and up to 26 miles per hour on a single charge. This was several years ago. So I now I imagine Charlie's on one of the uniwheels, which is even more terrifying than, than a skateboard. So um, that, you know, so we can build these things. If, if you can build a skateboard, we should be able to build some basic scientific instrumentation. And so the first thing that, that we were looking at doing was uh, seepage measurements. And so there's, there's different ways to get at seepage. Um, you can put a, basically an upside down bucket. You just press it into the um, a lake bed or stream bed, and then you have a plastic bag here, water flows into it. You measure the amount of water in the bag over that flowed in over time, and you can get an inflow rate, a seepage rate. The other thing you can, we also often do or put in, uh, lake bed piezometers. So if the, here's the where we're measuring the head in the lake, or at the lake bed here, and here's the the uh, uh, head or uh, the lake, and you can see that the what the head here is higher than the head at at the lake base, and so we have inflow. That's just kind of a basic measurement. We have inflow or outflow. Um, but some some things that issues are the seepage flux me flux measurements are really highly variable. And uh, uh, lake bed piezometers can be hard to read, and sometimes you might get a bypass. Um, depending on how you install them, you might get flow across here, and you might see no flow, uh, zero head change, no change implying any discharge. And so some of the things we tried to do, um, we, we started putting three seepage meters out. around. It's all close together, because then we can do statistics. That's 
Um, we got better results, but sometimes two showed a lot of seepage and one showed no seepage. What are you going to do with that? So that, that's an issue with the seepage meters. Um, and then with the lake uh, waves in the lake bed piezometers, we cut off the bottom of the trash can and placed it over the piezometer. And that kind of act like, acted like a stilling well. So that's, that's doing okay, but we still have that bypass issue. And we still have the kind of, sometimes the seepage meters just don't seem to work very good and which one's right. So uh, maybe about 10 years or so ago, uh, maybe even 20, Randy Hunt actually did some of the first work on this. Um, we, did, we looked at temperature flux measurements. So again, what you do is you put in your piezometer, so you get a change in head here. We've got high head in the lake, got low head down here. So we know we, know we have downward flow. And so then if we measure temperatures at these, at the lake bed, and then at these three depths, T1 through four, and we do it over like 48 hours or 72 hours or a week, the, the daily temperature is gonna fluctuate. And if we have downward flow, that's gonna carry that temperature downward. It's gonna carry that temperature signal downward. And we can use that, those signals to tell how, how fast things are moving, how quickly they're moving, and uh, how, how much they're moving. We can get seepage out of these measurements. And uh, the 1D tempro is what I use. It's really pretty easy uh, from, from the USGS. It's pretty easy to um, do the analysis. And so it's, a, it's kind of our third way to get at seepage. And so to build our instrument, these things were gonna cost, you know, if you bought one off the shelf, it's gonna cost thousands and maybe $10,000. So it's not a, not a low bar for entry for a method that I may or may not find useful. So I thought, well, let's Google Arduino and temperature. And if you do that, you can come up with, you come up with hundreds of pages, frankly. But this is the one I settled on where um, this uh, explains what materials are needed, how to connect them, how to connect the Arduino. And it gives you an example of the program. And uh, I chose this sensor rather than a thermocouple or a thermistor because um, they're, they're accurate, waterproof, easy to install, and you can connect like 20 of them and you only need three wires. All those other things are gonna be two wires, two to at least two wires per, um, per sensor. And so we can, it, it makes it a little bit uh, less cumbersome. And here's our, here's our installation. You can see each one of these uh, taped areas is one of those uh, temperature sensors. And um, we ran it all then to these connectors here. We run the connectors into our box. And here's our little Arduino sitting here um, with some 8D cells. And so we can run this thing for uh, over two weeks with these D cells on this Arduino. The Arduino has a, a, a little clock on here with a keep alive battery and there's the storage card. So every 10 seconds, it's gonna record seven temperatures and dump that onto the card and it can do it for two weeks solid. And here you can see, here's during installation, you can see in, uh, Wisconsin were maybe as hardy as those of you up here in Minneapolis were installing these in the ice in one of our local lakes, uh, just to test it. You can see the ice down here. And then here's a, a creek where it's quite a cold. And so here you can see we've installed the, there's the orange box that we've got here, we've installed it. And then here's a mini piezometer we're using to record that head, head difference as well too. And so here's what the data looks like at, at the site we were just looking at. Um, here's the temperature. Red is the temperature at the stream bed, 10 centimeters in, 16 centimeters in, 22, and then 27 centimeters in. And you can see that actually what, what we have here is downward flow because the, the, we're kind of pushing the temperature, uh, or we have upward flow, excuse me, because the temperature is, it isn't migrating downward very easily. It's only migrating downward by conduction, not infection. And so when we, this is an example coming out of temp 1D, we get a flux estimate of about 0.7 meters per day coming upward at, at that site. And then um, you can also get hydraulic conductivity and some other things out of, out of that software. Um, then we also thought, well, let's, you know, so most people do this vertically in lake beds and in uh, 
and in stream beds, well, let's look at a seepage phase. And so what we did then is um, there's an area of Kenosha dunes um, down in southeastern Wisconsin on the Lake Michigan shoreline, and it's eroding really rapidly. And people think seepage might be part of that story because the seepage is going to make the soil, um, it's going to reduce the soil strength and so it can fall and collapse more readily. So we wanted to get a measure of, of horizontal flow or horizontal seepage here. And so there's what the seepage face looks like. And we're going to put one of these instruments. We're going to put it, we, we have a shorter one that's only half a meter, not a full meter. And we put that into the, um, oh, actually here, here we're measuring, we still want to get a piezometer. Those temperature measurements by themselves aren't as good. You kind of need to get that head difference with them as well too. They don't work well without that. They're not as well constrained. And so here we're measuring the head uh, change or the pressure, the pressure change in, inside of the um, seepage face. You know, what is, the, what is the great hydraulic gradient driving the seepage? And so here's our hydraulic gradient of about 0.2 or 0.1. And we're measuring the head. Here you can see the water level. Here's the water level of, of the um, inside the pushed into the seepage face. And then here's the actual water level at the seat. So there we, you can see there's a nice uh, hydraulic gradient there. And so again, we have our box, we push our sensors in and we again get this temperature signal. We have it going over several days. And in this case, we got a little bit less seepage, 0.4 or so meters per day of, of discharge. And so you don't have to just do these things with vertical flow, you can do them in all sorts of orientations. Well, this kind of got us to thinking, so we've kind of got this on the shelf, we can pull this off and make these seepage measurements kind of anytime we want, but what should we do next? And, and you know, rather than put two sticks in the ground, maybe, you know, one for the piezometer, one for the temperature measurement, let's just see if we can, um, We'll use a pressure temperature sensor instead of the piezometer and the temperature sensors both. And um, these, this little sensor, they're used in fitness trackers and, and in altimeters. And so we can measure both pressure and temperature. So if there's variability in the sediment, if there's differences in hydraulic conductivity, we can probably sense that by measuring both pressure and temperature together. And so this is gonna allow us to really um, get a better sense of the heterogeneity of the subsurface. Because right now we're just averaging that pressure, but the pressure may change a little bit with, or the pressure gradient may change with depth depending if we have heterogeneity. Then the other thing that we thought we could do, well, let's attach a tilt meter so that we can record head automatically, you know, because you need to correct for elevation to get the head. So if we put in the tilt meter, we could also have it do that automatically. So we put it in at 45 degrees, doesn't care. It'll still tell us the gradient, the head change, all of that good stuff. And then we can have, have it be more automatic. So that's what we're hoping to do in the next year or so. And again, you can see these things, if we were gonna buy this and have it completely engineered, it would be really expensive. But if you buy these things, Arduino maybe costs $30, um, Eight dollars for the for the um, uh, tilt meter, and then these little sensors are maybe um, ten dollars each. So so it's a pretty inexpensive system. And these are the fancy ones. Those those other sensors were maybe a dollar or two a piece. So not very expensive. All right. So that's um that's making the measurements with temperature. But now we thought, well, let's combine the Arduino with GPS. And so we have a, the $30 Arduino microprocessor. And then on top of that, we can put uh, what they call a shield. It basically just slides into the, the top of that, the Arduino. And um, then we can also get our, our um, location out of this as well too. So on this, you can see here's our Keep Alive battery. This is a uh, GPS receiver. And again, here's that little SD card. So we Google, I just Googled this. It tells me what materials are needed. It tells me how to make the connections, how to connect the sensor, how to make the program. Um, I will say that when you mash together temperature plus the 
the um, location, it, it's not just going to be seamless. You're probably you have, you're going to have to do some um, work to to um, debugging to get everything to work well. So that that is maybe one of the downsides. But once you get it to work, you can measure temperature and have it be located. And so we put it in, uh, I, we called it the, ended up calling it the orange box. That's maybe not the best name, but it contains an Arduino and it contains that GPS shield. And we've got two of those waterproof sensors, a GPS 32 gigabyte micro SD card. And so this thing, when we plug it into uh, uh, with two AA batteries, it'll record time, latitude, longitude, and temperature every second. And it'll do that for, for several hours. Of course, if we plugged it in with those eight D cells, it would do it for weeks. Um, and so here's Gene Barr, myself, and uh, a grad student, Catherine Christensen. Um, we're measuring some temperatures in a trout stream in northern Wisconsin with, with this box. But right now it's recording temperature, air temperature, water temperature, location, and time. So everything's temporally and spatially located. Um, Kirk Olson, a, a DNR, Wisconsin DNR fisheries biologist, saw me give a talk on this or something and said, hey, Dave, can I borrow your, can I borrow that thing? I'm interested in the trout streams in Wisconsin. I'd like to know how they're, how they're operating. I'd like to be able to understand them a little bit better. So here's some data he took from Mapledale Creek. So, and hey, Dave, took the logger for a walk today, worked great which I was frankly surprised about because remember this is kind of a home built thing, but, um, but it worked, worked fine. He shared a map of it because remember it spits out the lat long and temperatures and our book and, brook and brown trout population estimates were fine. And he identified one very cold spring and a few others that were a little warmer. And so dark green is colder, uh, red, warmer colors are hotter. And so here's the little spring that he found down here is this little dark green nub. And so he can see that that springs maybe uh, 12 degrees when the main channel is more like uh, uh, 13 or, or maybe 14 or 15 degrees. So there's a nice little cold spring that might provide some refugia for the trout in during heat waves. The other thing you can note too is that we've got two tributaries. This one's a little warmer and this one's a little cooler and where they join, he didn't, walk all the way up it, but you can kind of see where they join, you get an intermediate temperature. And so, so he was able to kind of map out how this, the, this temperatures and be able to think about how the trout are gonna like or not like certain sections of the stream. Um, here's one where he did uh, the lacrosse river down by uh, Sparta. And again, same, same uh, uh, color, the scales change a little bit. The dark blue is 12 and uh, uh, red is now 19 degrees Celsius. And so kind of right down below a reservoir here, you can see there's some very cool water entering. That's some springs right here, kind of cooling things down a little bit. And if we look at the bigger picture, here's, here's that same area, a little bit cooler water. And as we go downstream, it gradually heats up. And then you can see this reservoir is significantly warm. So, so again, he's able to map how, how the temperature is changing um, spatially. And, and he, I think he was in a canoe doing that. So it probably wasn't like a terrible hardship for him either. Yeah. Yep, yep. So I'm, yeah, I've been accused of, have, of designing projects for that purpose, but, but I think it's really useful. I think it's really, yeah. So it's a really, you know, you just uh, gorilla tape the sensors. So they're at that, at a set depth below water with your canoe. So, cause that's one thing you're gonna, you know, water can change with the temperatures that change with depth. But um, that, that's the basic idea is let's collect a lot of data so we can really understand these streams and the, and the groundwater interaction with the streams. Yeah, so the most, ex the most expensive part of the orange box is the box, is that Pelican box. <laughs> and, and, we, and we've settled on the Pelican boxes. I, actually, I was talking, there's a group at uh, Montana Tech who's using Arduinos for, um, they're, they're mounting them on drones. But, 
they 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 3D print their boxes so they're lighter and custom designed and that may be better than the Pelican, but the Pelican's pretty easy to work. It's it's already waterproof, um, and so so that's kind of what we were using. We were using enclosures that were being sold by some of these Arduino uh, groups, but the plastic's hard, um, and, and they're not waterproof. Um, so, so, so then, you know, based on this, we thought, well, let's, let's go crazy. Let's uh, put all the water chemistry um, instrumentation on here that we can. And so we were using the Arduino Uno. And as you can imagine, the mega is a little bit bigger. Um, you know, you can, it can handle more inputs. It has more memory. It, it's it's uh, just uh, a step up from the Uno. And so with this, we connected GPS pH nitrate chloride, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, temperature, and then we were going to try to do turbidity, um, but we, we, we weren't really happy with that. We didn't really know how to calibrate it. And we thought, well, this can't work because the turbidity sensor that I'm showing here is what you would find in your uh, clothes washing machine. Um, but subsequent to this, a uh, professor at uh, University of Wisconsin Green Bay had a student do a study and these actually produced decent results. So they, they tested it against uh, one of the off the shelf high end turbidity sensors and you can calibrate these. So um, that, that may be something we wanna try to get back to at, at some point. I will say that the nitrate and chloride, um, these are ion specific uh, sensors and we did not have good luck with them. I think they were just a little too fussy to work in the field. They might have worked okay in a laboratory, but field-wise, uh, we, we kind of gave up on them in, in the end. I'm not sure we ever got data we believed from either one of those probes. But the other, the others in general, we did believe. Um, and also, again, the, the, those um, ion-specific probes, we had to separate them. So our plan was maybe to just put all of those probes in the water, just drape them over the canoe and just drag it along behind. But these probes all interacted. The resistivity probe would affect the uh, um, chloride probe, would affect the nitrate probe, and they all interacted. So what are we gonna do? Well, I, th I thought this was clever, but the sense of probes didn't work, it was kind of a moot point. Um, we separated them all and then in between, so the water would come in here, flow through this cell, come out there, go back around. And so we had three uh, flow through cells in succession. And then in between them, we put a little brass pipe and we grounded that pipe. So we could electrically isolate the probes. But since the chloride and the nitrate didn't really um, produce for us anyway, we didn't need to do that. We could have just, could have just ran it through. But anyway, this is our setup. Here's our probes um, set into our flow through cells, our, our three in series. And then here's kind of what the inside of the box looked like. There are a lot of conditioning um, um, boards in here to kind of get the signal from the sensors into something that the Arduino can use. And that's what all of, you can see this got really a lot more complicated. That's what all of these boards are doing is they're signaling um, or they're conditioning signals from the sensors and then putting them into the um, mega here. And then here's our GPS board along with the, the things that are being recorded. And you can see again, we've gone to a Pelican brief box there. We didn't start again, poor Catherine, uh, the graduate student you saw with when I showed the orange box. Catherine, we, we tried with the previous box that leaked a lot. And you can imagine in a canoe around water, the box got wet and we thought, oh no, we're not, it's not gonna work. She got a hair dryer, dried it all off and it worked again. But we were thinking this probably isn't gonna work. So that's why we switched to the Pelican briefs because they're just a lot more um, rugged, less likely to leak. And so here's there again, Catherine Chris, she was Christensen, she's a graduate student on the project and Susie Richmond did a lot of the design of the Arduino for, the, uh, for this part of, for the water chemistry. And so we put a bunch of things in the canoe. You'll note the canoe is all plastic. 
that's because we're uh, going to put an EM31 ground conductivity meter in there as well. So we have a camera in front. Um, we've got one in the back that's going to record down below. Um, we have a fish finder on the canoe. Uh, there's our water inlet. It's taped to the side uh, pump, a peristaltic pump. It goes through the flow, uh, flow through cell and electronics under the front seat. And then uh, there's the water outlet. So Catherine would ride in the front and kind of make sure everything was working and cleared up and, and ready to roll. And then the person in back was just there to steer the canoe and move it. Catherine didn't have to paddle. Her main job was to worry about the Arduino. Okay, and there's our EM31 ground conductivity meter. And so the, one of the downsides of this and one of the downsides of the Arduino is I'm not an engineer. No engineer, I would hope, would ever make a system that had seven batteries that can't fail for two to three hours. And so, you know, those, those are things you realize later when you just start glomming things together that at some point you may want to get an engineer. This is good for seeing if we're interested in continuing the method and maybe we can get it a little bit better. But I think at some point, um, especially if you're like going to Antarctica or someplace where it can't fail, you want to get an engineer involved so it's really ready to go. You know, if you're driving an hour or two north, then that's okay. Um, and so here's some of the data I'm going to show from the Quantico River watershed. It's it's a really kind of a half pretty pristine area. Um, it's kind of a remnant um, environment in southeastern Wisconsin. You know, there's a lot. That's where where Milwaukee is, Waukesha. There's a lot of build out um, um, there, and so. But, but this area is still, still really quite um, un, uh, unchanged from pre-settlement. And so there's a photo of uh, uh, some fen and tussock sedge wetland here. Uh, and there's a uh, um, canoeing. Uh, it's from one of our um, surveys here. And so here's, uh, we started up in a spring pool located up here. We're going to look at temperature first. Again, the scale is the same where blue is cool, uh, green is warmer. And you can see we in the spring pool, as you might expect, things start off colder and then they warm as we go, go down. And here's kind of what that, if we, zoom, if we were to zoom in that air photo, this is kind of, it's got a beautiful little spring boil there. Um, and so, so we know we're getting groundwater discharge at this point. And so um, then, so that's temperature. Let's see if I can. And then here's um, um, specific conductance of the water. And it starts off, uh, blue is lower conductance, uh, yellow is higher conductance. And it starts off as a higher conductance and then decreases until we get to this tributary where it um, uh, higher conductance decreases and then it jumps up a little bit here. This is kind of a low quality tributary. So I think it's got more nutrients in the water. Um, and so that's why I think that we see an increase here. I think the decrease here is we're shifting phase from a um, car calcium carbonate in solution, which it's gonna shift out and we're depositing marl. So we're losing, we're losing ions in the water as we go downstream. And then I note how different the lake is. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not enough of a limnologist to even speak to that, but there's, there's some data there. Um, and then also pH, again, kind of supporting that idea that we're shifting from dissolved calcium, magnesium carbonate to uh, having it come out of solution. The pH is a little bit um, lower at the spring pool, and then it um, increases uh, somewhat as we go here. I do not know what's going on with this area here. It'd be kind of fun to go back and double check that to see why, why things uh, decreased, why, the, why it became more acidic at that, at that area. And then, um, let's see, yeah, then the last um, measurement that I want to talk about is doing the electrical conductivity. And that's a, what it is, it's a measure of a material's ability to conduct electrical current. And um, um, so, so it's going to indicate lithology, a higher elect uh, electrical conductivity is going to be associated with more plates, more silts, more organic uh, materials, and probably a lower hydraulic conductivity. And then we flip that around, a lower 
electrical conductivity is probably going to be associated with sands and gravels and a higher hydraulic conductivity. So if we're going to try to figure out where groundwater can enter a system, a low electrical conductivity may be a high hydraulic conductivity, a sands and gravel, that might be a place where groundwater is going to enter a stream or a lake more readily than if we see the opposite, than if we have a high electrical conductivity. And so the idea is let's see if we can use this, this ground conductivity meter to measure electrical conductivity. Let's see, yeah. And so here, here we're just, so it's gonna, it's gonna, and this thing just averages over like the upper uh, two, three, four meters of, of the subsurface in the orientation that we have it. And so there, there we are, there's the canoe again. Um, there's Catherine and her assistant, Jake Westrich. And in this case, because we often use the EM31 on land separately from the system, we didn't connect it into the system, but we gave it its own, again, Arduino with a GPS shield. Again, here's the GPS battery. There's the keep alive. And, um, um, and this thing, this little nine volt will run it for um, five plus hours easily. And so again, this will record a ground electric electrical conductivity of kind of the top several meters every um, several every two seconds. And we'll have that conductivity time that long um, automatically recorded to that SD card. Now oh, there we go. And um, oh and so here's the principles it has a transmitter at one end, a receiver at the other. Um, if you hold it in the normal position, it'll sense down to about six meters. If you turn it 90 degrees, it'll sense down to about three. And that's the, that's the orientation that we had it in the canoe, is that horizontal. And then um, we, we also said, okay, so we've got one layer of air, we've got a second layer of water, and we've got the thing it is that we care about, the stream bed. Um, because we were able to measure the fluid conductivity with the Arduino, and we know the conductivity of air is pretty much zero, and because we had a depth finder, we can take, we can strip out from the measure, we can strip out the, the contribution to that conductivity meter that we read with the EM31, we can remove that effect and just end up with the stream bed conductivity, which is that thing we care about. Is it sandy? Is it silty? Is it clay? And that'll, the conductivity can indicate that. And it's a pretty quick calculation. G, um, McNeil Geonics Technical Note 6 is the one that will um, provide the equations to do that. And so here's a, a, a trout stream down in um, southwestern Wisconsin where we have the electrical conductivity. A low electrical conductivity, again, that's going to be our sands and our gravels, a high electrical conductivity is going to be our uh, mucks and our clays. And you can see it's kind of alternating as we go. And this kind of made sense. As we go down the river, there are little rapids, still pools, little rapids, still pools. So you'd expect the sediment, the finer grain sediment to kind of collect in the pools. And the numbers here, the 11, 12, 14, 15, all, actually, all of the um, triangles are where we collected sediment to kind of check. Is this making sense? Uh, is the instrument working? So blue is gravel, and yellow we think are silts and organics. And here's um, here's what those sediments look like. So eleven upstream, clearly all in the blue. You know, you grab a sample, you mostly come up with gravel. Go down to twelve, you grab a sample where it's green and yellow. And it's a lot of organics and muck in there. Uh, same with 14. And I don't know exactly. I, I hope that's vegetation, some sort of plant fiber there, but we, we can't be sure. Um, again, it's pretty, pretty mucky there as well. And then in 15, um, oh, in 15, again, you can see that we're in the gravel. So this gives us a pretty good indication of how the stream bed sediment changes. And we can probably imagine that where it's gravelier, we may get more inflow or things are gonna be better connected to groundwater. Um, and then the last thing that um, we did is, okay, so we've got this video 
and we've got all this uh, temporally and spatially located data. Um, let's see if we can combine them in one thing so that we can, for us, so we can review our data. And then if also if we wanna to explain to the public what we're doing, maybe we can also use this to, um, to, to get the public engaged, to help them understand what we're seeing, to help them correlate data. Because most people, you know, a pH of six and a pH of eight, that doesn't mean that much. It, you know, unless you put it in context, this will help put it in context. And so we use race render to mosh everything together. And um, Mike and Catherine, Mike Cardiff in the geoscience and Catherine Christensen, the grad student, put together just this wonderful little video of how uh, that explains what this is. And I'm going to click on it and we'll see if it comes up. Um, should come up in yeah, YouTube. Can we get sound on this? Not, not here today. Oh well, I can, I can. So you can read, you can read what's going on here, but it, but what what they're explaining is so that's the the uh, canoe. You're seeing the um, underwater camera. You're seeing the, the above water camera. Here's the underwater. Here's the above water, and they're located in space because we we know the timing of everything. Okay, so here's the camera. So again, Catherine's um, explaining what we've got, the M31, the, the transducers, the downward facing cameras. If you see me scowling there, that's because Catherine's cleaning some weeds out of the input uh, valve there. Um, so again, you can see as we go, we, we have the video running. Here's our location. As we go, you can see the red dot moving kind of slowly as, as we're paddling along. So that's our location in the air photo. That's where we're at in space. And then you can see over here, we've got the data. Um, and you can, um, so, so as we go, we started off about 16 and we went around the lake twice. We went all the way around once, turned around and went back the other way. And that data, that's what this data represents all the way around and then back. And so you can see the temperature warmed up a degree or so over, over that whole trip. And there's all the, all the other things. And sometimes where the dissolved oxygen was low, there was a lot of really kind of scummy um, uh, plant, uh, a lot of high algae growth uh, on the plants in, in, this, in the lake too. So um, we also did this for the Grant River. Again, you can see our location as we're going down the going down the river here. You can see the waters, this was more common than not. The underwater camera was kind of useless because the water was too turbid or it was too shallow and it goes by too fast. And so here we're coming up to a spring. And if we look at the water, here's here you can see the water temperature and you can see when we get to that spring, if we hung out there long enough, we'd see the temperature drop from 18 down to 14 degrees. So that. This is a great place to fish for trout on this, on this stream. Upstream of this, not so much because the water's a little too warm for them, but downstream it's much better. So I think that's, that is it. So I'll click back to here. Do one more slide, see if you have any questions. Thank you. A lot of questions. Yeah, I, I want to say this is where we're, our latest area is Leola Ditch in central Wisconsin. It's it's a the most ordinary drainage ditch you might imagine. It's straight for six miles, and so you think what could be interesting there. But there's areas where groundwater is flowing in. There's areas where groundwater is flowing out, and probably areas where it's flowing in one side and out the other. So even the most boring thing in the world. That when you look at it, there's there's kind of some something interesting. In the chat also. Oh, okay. All right. Do you have any resources on GitHub or Stack Overflow to see scripts you used? 
I, that's something we need to do. I can, we can make um, Susie Richmond's thesis and Catherine uh, Christensen's thesis have, have those things in it. And I believe um, Catherine just has been working on a manuscript talking about doing the canoe surveys. And I think she may have put things up on GitHub there as well too. But that's a, that's a great suggestion. I, I will uh, kind of push our team to do that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you had a depth sensor. On yeah. The boat. Was that um, like a, a sonic transducer sensing the depth of the stream, or was it like a, a pressure sensor? At a, at uh, it was. It was. Uh, it was an off-the-shelf because those aren't so expensive. It was an off-the-shelf um, um, fish finder that I just bought. Yeah. The problem with that is they don't. No one needs a fish finder that senses less than a foot. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna, that's gonna so, yeah, so, so in that case, you know, when we're doing that analysis to strip out the water and the conductivity from the water, I think we just said it was a foot. Or I think Catherine played around a little bit with sensitivity, the sensitivities of putting the water in and taking it out and seeing how much. You know, when when it's getting that thin, it doesn't have as big a contribution. But uh, but yeah, that's a great question and something we, we had to work work through and I, and I look to see if you can find one you know of course they're not nobody's going to sell a fish finder that goes you know two inches canoe depth and I think it would be painful to make an Arduino do it yeah so that um, the flow through last setup that you were describing it sounds a lot like a wide line yeah and like so like those kinds of things are available. Like was it yeah. what made you want to do it? Was it yeah. Better, better things, yeah. So the first time where I was doing this, we had our YSI meter was so old that I couldn't use it. It wasn't giving any, even though I tried to refurbish it and get it up to date, it wasn't working. And I didn't have the dollars to build yeah. to buy one. Yeah. I think if you have one, use it. Yeah. Yeah. You I could do this. Yeah, it was expensive. And, and the other thing, you know, think about how to, the other thing that this does is it automatically does that location stamp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if, you know, when we were trying to use our YSI sonde, our old one, um, we spent a lot of time uh, with the timing, getting that really accurate. And I see you want to, you know, think how fast you can move in a second in a canoe. You kind of want to have that degree of accuracy. So you want it to be within, you know, think about how, how fast you're doing your survey. That's going to control your timing accuracy between your YSI and your GPS. And you know, it's with with scripts you can merge those two. That, that, that's a way to go if you got one. Yeah. Do you have any examples where your probes are stationary and you're connecting them to the cloud? Or oh, yeah. I have no, I don't. I, um, I we haven't it, we haven't done that. And and the connecting to the cloud, I know, is pretty trivial. Again, with the or it's as trivial as you know the googling and then mashing that code with the uh, code that you're using to do the recording. Um, but then, but then again, you also need to uh, pay for it. You know, again, the the cost is going to be the the wireless connection. It is the um, or is the cellular connection, but it wouldn't be difficult. Uh, uh, it's a very common. I'm sure there's hundreds of examples. I've I've just googled it, googled it once or twice, but I have not tried to implement. It. But yeah, it would be easily done. You know the the a lot of our sensors, like the pH sensor, we would calibrate them before every run and then check calibration at the end. And I would not trust these sensors to sit in the water for a length of time. I, I would spend a lot of, I'd spend more money on the upfront on my sensors if I were gonna leave them out for a longer period of time. And, and invest in a, 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 a cloud connection. That, that's one thing that I would do over, spend more money on the sensors. 
that's going to do it again. You know, there's there's a sweet spot between you know a hundred dollars for an instrument and ten thousand dollars for an instrument. And usually the data loggers are much more expensive than the instruments. Yeah, that's the case for that for like the EM31. Yeah. We became very frustrated with how expensive the data loggers were, and they didn't record location. So Susie coded that up, and and um, wow, I use that thing all the time now. Record as as I go. Yeah, it's really useful. I, I've got I've got a student in, from UW Green Bay is using it to map up to bedrock and farm fields because he can correlate the. Because it's uh, 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 high conductivity soil over a low conductivity dolomite bedrock, and it, so you can the conductivity changes quite nicely. And again, you just back he toes it with an ATV on a sled. Oh yeah. Oh, is there much of a collaborative community with the Enviro do-it-yourself community to help everyone optimize their equipment, build setups? I, there is, there is, um, but I have not, I'm going to show my age and say that I haven't really connected in with, with that community, but, but there is, and, and I'm trying to think of the name, there's a, there's, there's some, there's an Arduino, um, the Arduino based instrument company that, that sells a lot of environmental um, style stuff. So again, it's a, it's a lower cost, um, lower cost. Um, is it Limnotech? What is it? Is it Limnotech? No. Okay. Uh, but Limnotech could be could be the, the place too. I mean, could Limnotech might be might be another alternative. Yeah. Uh, see my graduate, my graduate student working with me is asking these questions. Yeah. He's uh, interested in looking at the dynamics of stream networks, you know, like that upland or, or oh. Dry and then they'll you know, become functioning again. Yeah. So he's thinking about putting out some uh, sensors to tell whether there's water in the channel or yeah. whether there's you know, also he going to be able to measure the sort of flux either up or down. Yeah. Yeah. That that I mean that's that's where the wireless would be nice to come in there as yeah. well too, because right. in you know that's the other thing I thought about doing is. Um, Taking that that USGS code, kind of, and then you know applying, or maybe not that code, but what it's doing, and then just have it automatically calculate seepage, and you know, have the data come back, have some code that says, oh, I've got data, and work on it. What's the seepage? Oh, I've got you know, and just kind of real time update, or maybe you probably need a lag of a day or two to kind of real time update the seepage. Um, that that would be the other thing that. I think it'd be pretty cool. So I have a question about the temperature measurement in the, either you know, in, within the soil. Yeah. Yeah. We we use it in some stream beds. Uh -huh. We didn't measure the achievement levels. We just took those temperatures, and I think we got good results because we compared them to the flux meter. Okay. Yeah. Of course, across the channel. Got really large variation. Oh, in some places infiltrating over here and over here. Oh, uh, ah, uh huh. And and you were able to see that with uh, temperature yep. profile. Because oh, I always thought, oh, this thing's probably averaging. That's why it's a little more robust. They're sm well, smoothing so a larger area, but whether it was real or not. Oh no. Right. Are, but, uh, yeah. You know the trouble with the flux meter is you've got actually got any kind of flow in the channel. They work on some lights, but you got yeah. and you got a lot of Pressure yeah. So if you got base flow, maybe it's good, but if it's really high flow, it's not going to be as good. Yeah. But we, we found the temperatures, you know, we put some in where you just use the probe. Uh huh. Uh, and then throw a couple on it. Oh, so sure. yeah. Yeah. Drove it in. Yeah. Right. We yeah. also put some, you know, from the trees or maybe the thermos for trees and put them in and just left them there. Yeah. Recorded yeah. temperature over time. Okay, so we got so, really good agreement between temporal measurements and the spontaneous you know, measurements that we nice. seem nice. to. Yeah, but, no, I mean, I, we saw really large variations, but it's a nice way to get a lot of data. Yeah, because you can just walk up and you know, readers up and downstream yeah. and make these measurements. 
Yeah, yeah, and then it's pretty easy to to make them. What what so software do you? I'm asking is why do you why did you find it? I I saw um, a GSA presentation where a student had um, had said who who had had issues without measuring the the um, gradient. Right. Yeah, without measuring the pressure difference. Uh, she she made the point, that, and I I think it's valid that it really helps constrain the yeah. constrain yeah. it. Yeah, well, it tell you whether it's up or down. So whether yeah, it's right, up, right, right, right. Confirm that. Because with the capture measurement, basically you're looking for the detected flux. Yeah. Yes. The equation tells you what which way it's going to go because the equation is going. Yeah. Right. So, right. Right. And then yeah, you've got the stream bed conductivity. Yeah. So so I think, uh, and so I just kind of may, maybe I overemphasize that. It sounds like in your situation it wasn't that important. And and when I look at what I was doing here too, it. You know, it's pretty clear when things are up and when things are down. You know, when when you have downward flux, all those temperatures overlie each other from the surface because all the temperatures all kind of are the same. And you don't see the spread right. between the surface and the next one down, right? Like we are seeing here with the upward gradient. Yeah. So, yeah, and I and I think they require. I don't know if they require. What software did you use, Dan? Oh, we wrote our own. Yeah, I knew it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's kind of the thing I need I to do. Say the yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds like that. That's kind of what. That's what I've been thinking is taking a deeper dive and looking at the sensitivities of the different parameters. And um, before I get really too carried away with it, I've kind of taken this one D about as far as I. Well, I thought that the. Know. You know, so I mean, we took the idea from some paper by the USGS sure. Carpenter or. Um, I don't remember his name right now. Yeah. Fred Day Lewis is an on a lot of these. They software that was available through the USGS. Yeah, it's that, not every manual, but we still ended up writing it. Yeah, that's, yeah. If you got if you got a grad student who's a coder, yeah. that's the way to go. Because then you can test those sensitivities and do all sorts of better things with them. I, I have a, another question about the EM31. Yeah. I've used the EM38 to look at, yeah. you know, we were. Modifying salt and moisture or something. Yeah. Like that's very yeah. Saturated and, you know, as I understood it, the comment that, you know, probably if you found a layer that was higher conductivity, it would probably play a yeah. higher material because yeah. it would have more water. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So in this case, you're looking at saturated materials. Oh, so yeah. So the difference due to the porosity, and so you got a lower conductivity, the porosity is higher, or is there chemistry involved here too? I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, sand would have a higher porosity. Yeah, so yeah, energy. yeah. So I, I don't, th and it's kind of going to pretty much be the same. I think it might be the clays are going to have more um, uh, surface conductivity. Okay. So I, I think it might be mineralogic and not just pore fluid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, that's a good point. Yeah, the the EM thirty eight we we played around with that a little bit. It, it's it doesn't really sense deep enough for what we wanted to do. We wanted something that that got down that meter or two. That was the EM thirty one, um, and you can see it's really tucked tucked in. We had to buy uh, that plastic canoe because we couldn't have any conductors in in the canoe because that would have thrown off the reading. Yeah, we're another belt. Yeah, right, right, like right, right, right. Rings off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? This is quite clear. Did you learn to code at all? Did I learn to code? Yeah. I learned to um, hack um, Arduino scripts, yes. But uh, I am not to the level of a lot of the people. I mean, GitHub was mentioned. That's I mean, that's our life. If you code, you Google and GitHub, copy and paste. Why doesn't this work? And then you make it work. So I'm I'm not somebody who would want to pay to code, but but I can generally get things to work. And I should say that kind of the entry into like the Arduino world is you can buy starter kits for a hundred bucks or less, and they'll kind of take you through all the simple stuff, all the control and stuff. It's, if you're a hobbyist, it's a great, it's a great tool. If you like messing around, and it's a great tool. If you just want the answer, maybe not so much.
I'm going to try to just pull my. I know. I usually uh, am afraid yeah, just I to do that unless I release it or something <laughs> like that. I'm not sure what happens. It's causing bad karma. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You want to stop this first? Oh. Sure. Stop sharing. Stop recording.